working. Oh, okay. If you don't want to be recorded, please turn your video off. Um, yeah. So Ramian is a professor of plant pathology at Nottingham, and um, I think most of your work's been on wheat, if I'm correct. Is that? No, is we that just accurate? have a project. No, we just have a project on barley. Yeah. Okay. With David Crook. So Ramiana is both uh, has both a research and a teaching post, and most of her research has been on plant disease epide epidemiology, um, integrated disease management, host pathogen interactions, and host resistance. And one of the interests, our main interests, uh, our main disease interest, I suppose, will be in Fusarium head blight on cereals. And for working, if you're working on malting barley in particular, then you know that this can potentially be a bit of a problem. So, and um, Ramiana, I'm just going to pass the floor to you and um, yeah, thank you, Robbie. Over, over to you. Thank you very much. So thanks for the introduction. Um, as Robbie said, I will be talk speaking today about Fusarium head blight uh, with particular focus on the pathogens that cause the disease the mycotoxins that are being produced and the effects of fusarium diseases on yield and quality of barley. And as Robbie said, I'm a plant pathologist, so my area of expertise is really focused on the uh, disease aspect rather than um, the uh, processing aspect of the barley. So, first of all, um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of Fusarium head blight on cereals, and that's important uh, because um, Fusarium head blight is an important disease. Uh, it's um, a pre-harvest disease, and although we often speak of Fusarium head blight uh, in isolation, it's actually a part of Fusarium disease complex on cereals. And this diagram here shows you the um, the, the three diseases. Uh, within that complex. So you have fusarium head blight, but you also have seedling blight and foot rot. And most cereals are, are susceptible to pathogens that will cause all of those diseases during the crop growth cycle. So it's a sort of a, a catch-22 things in, ter in terms of the transmission of uh, pathogens between some of those diseases. So in relation to um, transmission, you can see here that there's various mechanisms for uh, dispersal and survival of the pathogens, and they're quite diverse. In terms of moving on between the diseases, most of the inoculum is provided either via the seed or mycelium chlamydospores to start the seedling blight cycle of the fusarium diseases, which then moves on to foot rot cycle. Again, initiated by mycelium canidia, there may be some systemic growth, which we don't fully understand. And then uh, from foot rot, which develops on the stems and stops the uh, nutrient and water flow transport in the stem going to the developing ear, then we have an inoculum that's being produced in the form of canidia and it's rain splashed, causing fusarium head blight on the heads of barley. There is some involvement of insects because insects contribute to the severity of fusarium head blight. They also contribute to the increase of the mycotoxin content within the grain. The majority of inoculum may also arrive through wind and rain splash dispersal mechanisms where Ascospora canidia are moved on to the heads. So obviously there is various ways that the pathogen can utilize to move on onto the host and they're quite diverse in terms of their ability to infect different organs on the um, on, on the host. It is not just it is not just that we have a fusarium complex of diseases. We also have a situation where all of these diseases are caused by a complex of fusarium and microdochium species. And you can see here a list of pathogens that are associated with fusarium head light. So these are the main, the most common pathogens that we may find on barley, on wheat. And these pathogens then cause the disease that is associated with mycotoxin contamination of grain. Fusarium species produce diverse secondary metabolites that can be harmful to humans and animals when consumed. We know quite a lot for some of the metabolites uh, and how toxic they are to humans and animals. For example, type B trichopsins, such as dioxinibalanol, type A trichopsins, HG22, 
and others such as the Arul non and for those there is safety European Union legislation that it's uh, set up uh, for certain limits within cereals. So, for example, the limit for dioxin is 1,250 ppb in unprocessed cereals. And HT22, we have a limit of 100 to 200 ppb, depending on the cereal crop that is affected. So, whether it's barley or wheat, the adult loan, the limit is 100 ppb. And then at the bottom here, you can see some other pathogens, some other my mycotoxins. And those mycotoxins are now being um, sort of merged. Uh, into uh, a one class known as emerging mycotoxins. And the reason why they are emerging mycotoxins is that there is no limit set up, mainly uh, due to the fact that we know very little about those mycotoxins. So monoliforming in eatins and bivaricin uh, produced predominantly by Fusarium abonisium poe and um, do not have limits yet because the toxicity of these mycotoxins is still undetermined and the uh, prevalence and abundance of the mycotoxins is also not determined completely around the globe. So once we have the stage of Fusarium head blight, very often the symptoms that are exhibited are these bleached glooms. You may see some uh, water soaked lesions that are caused by the infection on the glooms. And ultimately, at the end, we see a grain, which is not visually very, very um, attractive to look at because you can see the sporodochia of the uh, pathogens that are, that, that are, uh, are present on the, on the um, barley grain. And it's obviously some discoloration. Uh, the disease overall results in loss of yield and all of the Fusarium diseases uh, cause yield losses. In terms of Fusarium head blight, approximate yield losses can be 30 to 70 percent, depending on the pathogen that causes the disease. The biggest problem that uh, the disease is associated with is uh, quality issues. And those quality issues um, are due to the fact that grain viability is severely impacted and functional quality is reduced by the uh, contamination of the grain with the pathogens and also the accumulation of the mycotoxins. Um, the viability is it's, it's, um, affected, obviously, by the fact that um, the majority of these pathogens can kill the embryo um, and they reduce the um, plumpness of the brain. So they, they impact on the endosperm um, and that leads to reduced germinative energy of the grain. So germination can be severely reduced. So this presentation today is all about um, providing with some more current information on um, the predominant pathogens in barley that are associated with Fusarium head blight and the mycotoxin profile and also the consequences of Fusarium diseases and what are the measures that we can actually take for our disease management and bear in mind that the main measures that are available to farmers where we have cereal rotation, intensive cereal rotations, rely on chemical control. So I'll talk a little bit about chemical control and then I'll finish with just giving you some um, information on what happens with some of the mycotoxins as they go through the mulching process. So I'll start by giving you some information from work that we carried out almost uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this was funded through BBSRC and um, Innovate at the time and had several industrial partners. And this work um, aimed to um, monitor the situation on Fusarium um, species that have infected barley grains, in particular malting barley grains over a period of time. So you can see here 2000 to uh, 2011 samples that were taken uh, from uh, across the UK. The majority of samples actually came in 2010 and 2011, but immediately you can see that uh, this data that uh, is presented here is incidents. You can see that we have a situation where the main pathogens that we associate with Fusarium head blight, Fusarium graminearum and Fusarium fumorum, 
has actually showing a decline over the over the period of time that we've collected samples. And it's certainly clear that the predominant pathogens that are always found in high incidence include Fusarium poe, Fusarium avenisium, Fusarium trisinctum, and Microjochium species. So quite a diverse pathogen complex and um, clearly different in barley compared to wheat. At the time when we first did some mycotoxin um, quantification on these samples, we found we first focused on the uh, trichophysins and looking at the overall mycotoxin presence in these barley samples, we can see that the only mycotoxin which is actually increasing over time is nivalanol. And we have relatively low concentrations. We have relatively low incidence of the other of the other mycotoxins. Recently, we decided to um, dig out the samples and to actually re-examine them for the emerging mycotoxins. And that's mainly because we did find a lot of Fusarium avenisium in our samples. And amazingly, what we found was that actually these samples had a lot higher concentrations of emerging mycotoxins. So eniotins were one of the mycotoxins that were present in high incidence and also very high concentrations. So we're talking here about 1,978 PPB uh, being present in those samples, especially in 2010 and 2011. So we see that we have high incidence of those. There is less of monoliformin. Monoliformin again is produced by Fusarium avenisium. So it appears that certainly for these samples, we have a predominance of Fusarium poe, Fusarium avenisium, Tristinctum, and Microdochium species. And the main toxins really that we should be concerned about are nivalenol and eniotin B, because those are found in high incidence and higher concentrations. So how are those uh, Fusarium species distributed across the UK? Uh, looking at just the Fusarium species across the UK, you can see that they're fairly uniformly distributed in all regions. And there is some variation. The variation is due to differences in season rather than region. Uh, in contrast, if we look at just microdochium DNA across the different regions, we can see that microdochium DNA is much higher in the north of England and also in Scotland. So. Obviously, microdochium is going to be associated with Fusarium headlight in north of England and Scotland and less in the south and in the Midlands. In terms of grouping of the pathogens, there, there are some close associations between them. So not between perhaps Fusarium culmorum and Fusarium poe, which were found in the samples. And to be frank, we don't see much Fusarium culmorum anymore in cereals in the UK. Um, but mostly between Fusarium langsepi and Fusarium trisinctum, they were close groupings together. And then if we look at Fusarium griminiarum and Fusarium avenisium, also see that they sort of co-occur. And the same for Microdochium majus and Microdochium nivelle. I must say that these four pathogens, Graminiarum avenisium and the Microdochium, the two Microdochium species, are the ones that frequently co-occur together. And also, they tend to have a positive associations. So specifically Fusarium avenisium tend to cooperate with other pathogens. Uh, in terms of the producers, then we can see that Graminiarum and Kumorum DNA in our samples correlated very strongly with deoxynivalenol. So we know deoxynivalenol in barley is associated with those two producers, Graminiarum and Kumorum. That was not surprising. What it was surprising for us was that we found that nivalenol was associated with DNA Fusarium poe. So Fusarium poe is the main producer of nivalenol in barley, not Fusarium culmorum and Fusarium griminiarum. And we also found a very strong relationship between Fusarium avenisium DNA and eniotin B in our barley samples. So obviously Fusarium avenisium is the main producer of the eniotins in our samples. So that suggests to you that Fusarium avenisium, actually it's one of the species that is quite important. And that's where we started because the link really between Fusarium head blight 
and Fusarium seedling blight, the two diseases of the Fusarium complex, it's this infected grain. So the first thing that we want to look at is what is the mycotoxin profile of isolates of Fusarium abonisium that were found in barley. And we isolated several Fusarium abonisium isolates, and then we looked at how they produce mycotoxins and what type of mycotoxins are produced in vitro first. So here you've got a list of Fusarium abonisium isolates and one Fusarium trisinctum isolate. And all of this produced in eating A1, in eating B, in eating B1, and monoliformin. So they're very potent producers. We do not found any bivaricin. So bivaricin in our samples were produced only by Fusarium poe. When you actually take those isolates and then uh, use them to inoculate Fusarium, um, to inoculate barley to cause Fusarium head blight, we can see that there are some differences. Some of those isolates were no longer producing any in A1 in vivo. So in vitro they produce it, but in vivo we, we found that some of those are not very potent producers. However, they all continue to produce the others in eating B and in eating B1. And interestingly enough, the DNA of Fusarium abonisium of our isolates correlates very closely with the actual eniotin B accumulation within the grain, within the plant samples, irrespective of the genotype that we've used. So these two genotypes, Moonshine and Quench, they're both quite susceptible. And they all fit on the same line in terms of the DNA and mycotoxin production. So there is no difference between them. So we can say that. We have Fusarium abonisium populations which produce in eatings and monoliformin in vitro, but no bivaricin. Not our isolate producing in A1 in vivo. And in eating B, accumulation is related very strongly to pathogen DNA. The next stage of our investigation was to look at pathogenicity and aggressiveness of isolates of Fusarium abonisium to barley. So we need to do that to compare really where Fusarium abonisium ranks um, in relation to other pathogens that are associated with disease. So Fusarium seedling blight, you can see here the symptoms on the barley seedling. So a quite reduced growth of the seedling. And the thing that you can also observe on this graph is that we have different isolates of Fusarium abonisium, and we've compared them in terms of their aggressiveness so how severe Fusarium seedling blight is to, to disease when it's caused by Fusarium graminiarum isolates, Fusarium poa isolates, or Fusarium trisinctum isolates. Immediately, you can see that the most severe disease is caused by Fusarium abonisium isolates, so they're quite aggressive, and they certainly rank high in aggressiveness in comparison to Fusarium poa and Fusarium trisinctum or even Fusarium graminiarum. And then compare the same Fusarium abonisium isolates to the most pathogenic Fusarium graminiarum isolates from the seedling assay. You can see here in terms of causing Fusarium head blight on barley. So Fusarium abonisium is comparatively high on the aggressiveness, but clearly the most severe disease was caused by Fusarium graminiarum. So there is some variation in terms of the aggressiveness of those isolates and in causing Fusarium head blight. There's certainly coming, some of them are very close to being as aggressive as Fusarium graminiarum, but there is a wide variation between them. Overall, the isolates that cause severe Fusarium seedling blight also caused severe Fusarium head blight. So close association between the aggressiveness of those isolates in causing any of the Fusarium diseases here on barley, irrespective of the genotype that we have. And that aggressiveness was also associated with the accumulation or the ability to produce eniotin B. Uh, so the greater the eniotin B accumulation, the more severe Fusarium head blight in this case, and we had here some differentiation of genotypes. So in the case of Concerta and Propina, clearly Concerta accumulates less in eutin B and also it has less Fusarium head blight um, 
disease severity compared to propina. Overall, clearly, Fusarium seedling light, um, in terms of Fusarium seedling light pathogenicity, Avenicium is much more pathogenic than any of the other Fusarium species that we looked at. And it appears that isolates of Fusarium Avenicium are clear, equally aggressive to barley stems and heads. Furthermore, in terms of Fusarium head blight pathogenicity, they come closer to Fusarium graminearum, so second to Fusarium graminearum. And also the relationship is uh, strengthened by their ability to uh, produce inutin. So isolates that produce inutin A1 and B were much more pathogenic, much more aggressive than isolates that were unable to produce uh, inutin A1. They're certainly more pathogenic than poor or true symptom that we've tested in our studies. So often when we have fusarium head blight, before we have fusarium head blight, the first um, probably disease that uh, we may note in the field is fusarium foot rot. And I've mentioned fusarium foot rot already. When we have severe fusarium foot rot, what you see on the field is very often scattered whiteheads uh, of barley, and those whiteheads are partially empty. So we do have a significant impact on quality parameters of yield. And those quality parameters include thousand grain weight and specific weight. Specific weight is very important because it relates to the plumpness of the grain. So obviously we want to have as high specific weight as possible. If we look at the main pathogens that are associated with reduction of uh, thousand grain weight in barley, we can see that Fusarium avenicium is always involved together with microdocium species, one way or another. There are some differences that are due to season. So in different years, they may contribute differently to, to that uh, impact on thousand grain weight, but it's those three pathogens that impact on thousand grain weight. When we look at specific weight, the two pathogens that affect specific weight are Fusarium abonisium and Fusarium gramiliarum. And I think from my presentation so far, you may have gathered that obviously these are the most aggressive pathogens to barley. And those are the ones that would be reducing specific weight in barley. With the contribution of Fusarium abonisium much greater than Fusarium gramiliarum. There is a good reason why this may be the case, because with foot rot, you will have obviously um, deformed grain formation and um, a specific weight will be affected. And we can see that that relationship is really strong when foot rot is called by Fusarium abonisium. So uh, it's not just Fusarium head blight, but also the foot rot that will impact on those quality parameters. We can go a little bit further by looking at how this relates to the ability of isolates to produce inutins. And it's clear that if you have uh, inutin production by those isolates, for specific weight is reduced. The reductions are even greater when we have two inutins, inutin A1 and inutin B that are being produced by isolates. So isolates that do not produce inutin A1 do not cause as high losses as high reductions in specific weight. Furthermore, specific weight relates very closely to germinative energy. So if we look at germinative energy, isolates that do not produce in eating A1 actually reduce very little the germinative energy of the barley grain. However, isolates that produce both of these, A1 and B, um, can cause very significant reductions in germinative energy. And in addition to that here, we can also spot that there is some differences in our genotypes that we've used. So the reduction in germinative energy is much greater in propino, which appears to be less tolerant to infection by Fusarium abonisium. So what are the effects on yield? Uh, the effects on yield by infection by Fusarium abonisium can range from 27% to 17%, and you can see here how two genotypes that have different tolerance to Fusarium abonisium will have also different percentage loss of yield due to uh, infection of Fusarium abonisium. So the difference between those two genotypes is 10%, with Concerto 
actually accumulating less loss than propino. So what can we do um, to control fusarium head blight or any of the fusarium disease, as a matter of fact? Uh, in Bali, we have uh, two times when we apply fungicides, uh, T1 and T2, growth stage 13, growth stage 39. Fungicides are applied this, these two timings mainly to control foliar disease, not to control fusarium head blight. In wheat, we do have a T3 application, uh, which is specifically aimed uh, targeting fusarium head blight. So we tested with some of our work whether a T3 application in barley would be beneficial for the control of fusarium head blight. And here you've got an example. We have some treatments where we didn't put any T2 or T3 fungicides, uh, a treatments where we just put T2 fungicides or no T3 fungicide, and the T3 treatment that consisted either of proficonazole, succinate dehydrogenase inhibited isopyrosam, and proficonazole of fluoxetine and proficonazole with fluoxetine being a strobilurin. And if we look at just the disease severity, there is a reduction in disease severity by T2 application, and also a little bit more of a reduction if you apply another fungicide spray to target um, fusarium head blight T3, so growth stage 59. In terms of yield responses, to those fungicides, then we can see that the T2 and T3 response, uh, it's up to 0.72 tons per hectare in barley, and T3 response alone is 0.36 tons per hectare. So half of it is for, from the T2 response, half is from T3 response. And obviously, because proficonazole is active against fusarium species, we almost, uh, we see very equal uh, increase in yield. So the main purpose of a chemical control is to um, obviously control the pathogens. And um, we looked at the control of Fusarium avernicium by these uh, fungicide applications and the timing of fungicide applications. So with Fusarium avernicium, we actually see very good control uh, of pathogen DNA, so good reduction. Uh, by T2 spray. So growth stage 39 spray would reduce pathogen DNA by half. And there is some additional reductions that are achieved by the use of succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors in barley because they seem to be active against Fusarium abernicium. The reason for that is that there is a very good relationship between foot rot disease index and Fusarium head blight for Fusarium abernicium. So by controlling foot rot probably at the uh, T2 application, you get a additional control of fusarium head blight because you're reducing inoculum. And it's clear that again, we have some um, separation of our genotypes, Concerto and Propino in this case, with Concerto that is much more tolerant to both foot rot and fusarium head blight. The question is, what is the uh, effect of fungicides to other fusarium pathogens? So let's have a look at um, fusarium graminearum. So in contrast to fusarium abernicium, where we did have a very good control of fusarium abernicium with a, a T2 application of fungicides, there is no control of fusarium graminearum with T2 application of fungicides. So that suggests that if we wish to control fusarium graminearum in barley, obviously this fusarium graminearum inoculum is not coming um, solely from the ground. It may be arriving through other dispersal mechanisms and therefore the head needs to be protected and the head can be protected by an application of growth stage 59. Again, the best control of Fusarium graminearum was achieved by a treatment that contained Fusarium graminearum active fungicide and that was proficonazole. The other additions of isopyrosome of loxostrobin had very little effect in controlling Fusarium um, graminearum. So <clears throat> the basic conclusions here are that if your predominant pathogen is Fusarium abernicium, obviously you can get away with a T2 application of growth stage 39 and you don't have to worry about applying a further spray later on at year emergence. However, if you are worried 
uh, of Fusarium graminearum, then growth stage 59 or T3 is very important for the control of that pathogen. It becomes even more complicated when we start looking actually at the mycotoxin uh, control because um, that appears to be interacting with the previous chemistry that has been used as a T2 application. So overall, there is some control where we have a profile conazole as a, a ear wash spray applied at gloss stage 59 following isopyrosum. So this is the succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor. There is very little control, even with profiloconazole, if you follow fluoxetrobin. So strobilurin uh, at T2, it's not beneficial for the control of dioxin valinol. That's not the same for ziarolinone, where we always see the control of that mycotoxin by the um, profiloconazole treatment at T3. Again, there is no uh, effect of T2 treatment. So definitely, if it's a Fusarium graminearum pressure and risk of that pathogen, we need to be thinking about ear wash spray. Another aspect that we were concerned about, particularly for uh, the quality um, as for the quality impact of those pathogens on barley, was um, the effect of delayed harvesting, because some of these mycotoxins actually increase. Uh, due to delay in harvesting. So that means that your grain viability will be reduced further and you have higher contamination of the mycotoxin. And we did set up a few experiments in different sites to look at the effect of delayed harvesting on pathogen and bison accumulation. And we found that there was um, in the three species, Graminearum avenistium trisinctum, but more importantly, the only mycotoxin which was affected by delayed harvest was the arolinon. And that's important because the arolinon has a very stringent 100 ppb limit of uh, grain uh, intake. So if we need to control the arolinon, we need to make sure that grain is harvested on time, particularly in relation of uh, seasons where we have very high humidity and high wetness at the end of the season. I didn't really want to go too much into um, the um, resistance uh, of current genotypes because the varieties that we looked at, the commercially available varieties, and we looked at a lot of commercially available varieties um, that's in different seasons, in different sites. Overall, there is a very narrow range if you look at uh, DNA accumulation within those varieties. It particularly, even if you split them up on DNA of trichopsin B producers, microdocium species look even worse because you can see that there is no difference in terms of microdocium DNA across these varieties. And this suggests that all of these varieties, all of these commercially available genotypes will be particularly susceptible to microdocium. So that should be a target for our, you know, new breeding of more resistant varieties. And if we look at the other Fusarium species, again, there is a very poor correlation, there is a very poor uh, differentiation between the, the genotypes. Perhaps, you know, this differentiation here fits best with what we see in terms of tolerance to Fusarium abonisium with uh, concerto, typo, and optic being a little bit more tolerant. That's not the same if we look at the trichopsin B producers. So if motors and the motors and the brewing industry, um, perhaps the most important um, consideration for them is to look at consistency of certain trades across seasons rather than to base their selection uh, on the varietal resistance to Fusarium headlight because um, it's more important that quality characteristics, quality traits such as germinative energy and water sensitivity are actually consistent for the particular genotypes, even though the season has differed in terms of both pathogen, pathogen DNA accumulation, both mycotoxin accumulation. And, and here we can see that the most consistent genotypes are really optic, concerto, and typo. Again, these are 
the best genotypes here with accumulating least pathogen DNA. And in terms of water sensitivity, the most consistent genotype uh, across the two seasons, 2012 and 2013, it's concerta here. All the other genotypes can have various degrees of that uh, of uh, variation of that trait across the uh, the two seasons that we looked at. So, all the naturally infected samples from our survey uh, were taken forward for molting. Um, for further mulching uh, experiments to determine which species affected some of the main mulching um, parameters uh, for quality. And if you think that most of the samples were actually quite poor in terms of germination, the, the, the criterion for germination was lowered for the samples. And the ones that we were able to pass through, we can see that there's three species that were present in the naturally infected samples, Fusarium poi, Fusarium langsefia, and Microdocium naevelli, that impacted on the uh, number of quality parameters that included germinative energy, water sensitivity, malt friability, malt alpha amylase, extract of malt, lab word filtration, free amino nitrogen, and lab word color. With Fusarium poi and Fusarium uh, Langsefiae affecting particularly the extract of malt. They also uh, increased free amino nitrogen in uh, in the um, during the process and in a competitive fashion. And Fusarium poe and Microdocium navelli were the main species which were actually associated with reduced germinative energy and increased water sensitivity in the samples. Microdocium naevelli also affected other parameters, malt friability, positive impact, but it had a negative impact on lab word filtration and lab word color, and there was quite significant impacts of the variety and ear in these models. If we look at uh, the effect of infection by Fusarium avenicium on uh, the same parameters, then we can see that infection actually affects in the same way as Microdocium naevelli, germinative energy is reduced. We have increased malt friability. We have reduced malt uh, alpha amylase. And I can tell you that also we have reduced malt, malt beta amylase by Fusarium avenicium. We also have reduced lab wood filtration and we have an increase in free amino nitrogen and lab word color. So Fusarium abonisium is one of the pathogens that will affect the mulching parameters. In addition to that, the genotype is making a difference as to how these parameters are affected because in most cases, um, Concerto had a positive impact compared to Propino, which was less tolerant. So what happens to Ineatins, because we're talking a lot in that presentation, about Fusarium avenicium during the mulching process. What we did is uh, we took some barley that was infected with three isolates of Fusarium avenicium. So you have Fusarium um, FA55, 40, and 225. And we infected the two genotypes that we work mostly with, so CV Concerta and CV Propino. And we measured in eating A1, in eating B, in eating B1, and the pathogen DNA, Fusarium avenicium DNA, during the molting process, so steeping, germination, and kilning, to see what happens to the microtoxins and to see what happens to pathogen DNA in those two genotypes. And immediately you can see that two main factors are affecting what is happening to the molting process. The two factors are isolate, because isolates such as FA55, which is very, um, it's, it's less pathogenic, it's less virulent, does not produce the full spectrum of mycotoxins, particularly in ETNA1, which appears to be related to virulence. It's not causing massive problems. But when it comes to actually looking at isolates that potent producers of those mycotoxins, then we have much greater amounts, and these are uh, obviously, I've left this data untransformed so you can see the actual amounts of the mycotoxins. 
Um, the other factor that's quite important is the genotype. So Propino is uh, less tolerant. We have much greater accumulation of the mycotoxins throughout these processes of the molting, um, of the mold, and it certainly uh, that is making a big difference to what happens over the uh, process. The from harvest. To steeping, we see a reduction in the microtoxins. So obviously, the steeping process uh, eliminates uh, most of the inertins. Well, not most of the inertins, but about thirty percent reduction of inertins in both cases. And then we see uh, a very um, rapid, very big um, increase of all of the microtoxins during during germination. So. In terms of the increase from steeping to germination, we are looking at up to 60% increase of mycotoxins during germination, and that relates to the increase of pathogen DNA during germination. So we do have an increase in mycotoxins, but the ratio actually of pathogen DNA to mycotoxins, um, it's um, it's very much very different to the initial ratio of those uh, of those samples when you first take them from harvest, because here we have um, a lot of mycotoxins, a lot of DNA. Whilst during germination, we have mostly accumulation of mycotoxins and, and less DNA being uh, present in those samples. Kilning, on the other on the other hand, uh, eliminates again mycotoxins. So this is mainly through the thermal process. So thermal, some thermal degradation occurs during kilning. And obviously, when you remove the rootlets, you get rid of a lot of the mycotoxins and some pathogen DNA. So overall, very similar across the genotypes, but quite a different concentrations of both mycotoxins and uh, pathogen DNA, um, depending on the tolerance of the, gen the genotypes. So isolate aggressiveness and inherent ability to produce mycotoxins is quite important as it enters the chain. Uh, genotype appears to be quite important. And germination is the key stage when we see an increase. This is not different to what other people have shown. So there's plenty of papers uh, on this which show that germination during the germination stage, we see a massive increase of mycotoxins. And in opposite to, um, to the dioxin and valinol, actually in eatins, tend to be retained more during steeping. Um, kilning is very effective in decreasing mycotoxin levels. So if we look at the, the amount of decrease or elimination, we're looking about 85% irrespective of genotype from harvest to kilning. So I'm finishing now my presentation and what I need to say is that we have a very diverse complex of species that are predominated by Avenisium, poetry, symptom, and microdocium in Bali. The, we have an emerging microtoxins in Bali. So these include eniotins. We know very little about their toxicity. We know that they're phytotoxic and cytotoxic. Nivalenol also is it's, um, it's quite toxic. We know little uh, about nivalenol being produced by many uh, many of the other alternative producers, such as Fuzara and Poe. And therefore, these are the producers that require much more attention. Uh, Fusarium avenisium appears to be equally pathogenic to stems and heads of barley with some variation in the ability of isolates to cause Fusarium head light. But isolates that produce uh, high amounts of inietin A1 and B can be comparable to Fusarium graminearum in terms of aggressiveness, in terms of causing Fusarium head light disease. Specific weight. And germinative energy are the key parameters that are effective, affected by all fusarium pathogens, but most of those fusarium pathogens won't go through the screen as they go towards molting. However, some of those fusarium pathogens will pass through that screen. So fusarium pathogens such as Avenisium, Trisinctum, uh, Microdocium, and Lancephii will probably pass. And then there may be further problems later with the molting quality parameters. Obviously, there's two aspects of control. One is pre-harvest and one is post-harvest during the mulching processes. And it appears that the chemical control pre-harvest does need to include some form of um, T2 fungicide if we try to control Fusarium avenisium. 
In the case of Fusarium graminearum, we do need to have a near wash spray and the severe circumstances. And there is generally a narrow range and variation of genotype response in commercially available, at least the ones that we looked at uh, genotypes in response to Fusarium head blight infection. So the advice, what I would give to Maltus is to look at um, consistency in quality parameters. Um, the second stage of control is during the molting process and kilning is probably the best step where we remove a lot of the mycotoxins. So it's very unlikely that those toxins will actually go down to, to brewing in high enough amounts to cause problems. So thank you very much for your um, attention. I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, David Cook, Susan, Clegg, Safi Edin, uh, Rob, Linda Nielsen, Arifa Faruqi from University of Nottingham that contributed to his work, a lot of them for the Safe Mode project, and then Simon Edwards at Harper Adams University, who's also uh, involved in the Safe Mode project, and there's several um, companies that were uh, partnering on the Safe Mode project. So I'd like to stop there. Thank you, thank you for your attention, and uh, I can take some questions if there is time. Thank you, Rumiana. Fascinating. Um, can I just ask the audience if they've got any questions, either to jot them down in the chat, because then I can see when they are asked, um, or if you want to just shout out when nobody else is asking questions, then just shout out. So I'm going to start from a really, I said, it was a stupid question from myself, and that is, what are the effects of all of these uh, mycotoxins on humans or animals when ingested at levels above the official limits? Okay, so so very little is known um, about the emerging mycotoxins. So that we know that the neotins um, would would have cytotoxic effects um, to human cells, epithelial cells. Um, they would also affect um, cholesterol in the human body. They may have some uh, hormone effects similar to zearolinone. So zearolinone is endocrine disruptor. Uh, and they would affect a lot of the human hormones, such as, and the same in animals. So estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And so in animals. Symptoms? Sorry? What would the symptoms be? And would, be, would they be long term? Well, the the, be, the 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 more acute symptoms with uh, the trichopsins and the worry in terms of the European Union legislation point of view, it's with the emerging mycotoxins is to do with chronic exposure, not with acute exposure. Okay. Uh, okay. The other ones, obviously, the oxynivalenol is very well known as vomitoxin, and that tells you a lot about vomitoxin. <laughs> <laughs> of what it does. Uh, to animals, it's extremely, extremely damaging. Um, it causes lesions on the livers, the livers and problems with feed intake. So there is various, various effects on, on animals. Okay. Nasty things. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have a, a question from uh, Luke Ramsey. A fascinating talk. Was there any indication as to the mechanism underpinning the differentiation between concerto and propino with regards to foot rot, fusarium, fusarium head blight, and so on. I guess the implication is that there's a genotypic effect, so some kind of genotypic. Yes, we see the genotypic effects, particularly in relation to infection by Fusarium avenicium. There is two aspects which are interesting <laughs> in terms of Fusarium avenicium, which can be helpful actually in identifying resistance to other Fusarium pathogen. The one aspect is there is an excellent relationship with pathogen DNA, production of mycotoxins and effects on the host. And the other aspect is that we can identify actually a much more rapid screen where we use Fusarium avenicium as a model pathogen because of being virulent, equally virulent to all tissues on the host. So that makes it perfect for a rapid screen. And we know that the resistance to most Fusarium pathogens goes down similar genetic control. Uh, 
in terms of the genetic differences, we don't know the mechanism because that's the first, you know, that's the first time we've observed them. And we haven't delved really deeper into that. I, I don't know why Concerto appears to be more tolerant to infection by Fusarium mabinicium than Propino, for example. And and also I think there is needs to be a bigger screen than these two genotypes. I mean, we only worked with a limited number of genotypes in this case. Um so, so yeah, I think Fusarium abonisium is the perfect candidate to actually, you know, look for phenotyping for Fusarium head light resistance. And I think it's possible for us to develop a screen to allow us uh, high throughput using that pathogen. Uh, that may be helpful then in identifying genes that will be important to the other Fusarium species. Great. Thank you. So, Susan Breen has a question. Um, Susan asks or says that you show two isolates. So, Avenisium FA55 and FA40. Yeah. One with little mycotoxin and the other with higher mycotoxin production. And the question is, how do these two isolates compare to those that are dominantly found in the field? That is, do field isolates have a similar mycotoxin production as FA40 or FA55? So all of the isolates that I've shown, and there were nine isolates that I've shown in this work, all of these isolates are field isolates. So those isolates were isolated from the barley lots that we received through the survey samples. So they're directly relevant to what's present in the UK fields. We know that in the UK, that you know we don't we don't have production of bivirucin by Fusarium mabinicium because we couldn't find bivirucin producing isolates. <laughs> what we did find is that the only bivirucin that was produced was produced by Poe isolates. Mm. So. We didn't measure the bivirucin. I mean, we could be measuring mycotoxins for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, if we start doing all of them, even the glucosylated forms, the acetylated forms, and everything else that exists. Um, so there is a variation in terms of the ability to produce uh, certain mycotoxins. We certainly see that the anitins, uh, particularly B and A1, appear to be related to the virulence, and that's not uncommon for Fusarium pathogens. They use mycotoxins to further the disease. Particularly, the same mechanism applies for Fusarium grimnianum using dioxinivalenol. And we know nivalenol it also has different functions mm. uh, for, the, for the pathogens. Some of them to further disease, some of them have other functions. So, so yeah, the, the isolates are diverse. Um, we could be, uh, I think we need to do more work on Fusarium avenisium, if you ask me, uh, because uh, we need to understand really how this relates to, um, to, to, to the disease, how this relates to um, toxicity, and it's quite helpful in terms of setting up further um, legislation for these mycotoxins. Can I, can I ask if um, Fusarium head blights is influenced by whether or not the cultivar um, is fertilized within the boot or not? So some barley cultivars, the, the fertil anthers and oh, yes. and fertilization occurs within the boot. Oh, you mean so they're, they're open or, or close um, flowering? Um, no, I didn't mean that. I meant to, I meant whether or not they, they predominantly were um, Anthesis happened within the boot, so flower development happened within oh, the Oh, right, 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 right. Yes, there's, it's very common for barley. <laughs> Yes, very common for barley. Um, those cultivars that flower within the boot um, tend to have less Fusarium head blight because obviously Fusarium head blight pathogens need to enter via the um, amphis. They, they utilize the amphis. One of the mechanisms for them to, to actually enter the glooms and the ovaries is via those amphis. There is a big difference also between varieties that are closed or, or open flowering. So the closed flowering varieties tend to have less fusarium head blight because the amphis are retained, although that can vary depending on when the infection then occurs as well. So, so generally amphi extrusion and the presence of amphis for long periods of time being outside of the glooms contributes to increased severity of the disease. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Um, Ramiana, I've got one final question before I think our time is up. It comes from Dan Bandani. Uh, 
from HDB, and that is, did you look for masked forms of any of the mycotoxins? So I don't even know what masked forms are, so maybe you could start with that. Yeah, so the mass forms of the mycotoxins we refer to as the glucosylated forms. So those uh, uh, products of the um, some of the detoxification uh, okay. mechanisms that are uh, used by the host. Um, we didn't we didn't look for the mass mycotoxins, um, but I think it's quite important, and probably those mycotoxins will also play a role, um, further role in relation to um, the varietal uh, resistance. So how good certain genotypes are to deal with mycotoxin accumulation yeah. or detoxification. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to give the audience one last chance to ask a question if they want to. And the only way to do it now is to unmute your microphone and ask the question. So just I'll give you a few seconds. If you want to ask a question, please do. Okay, looks like there's no other takers. Rumiana, listen, thank you very much um, for telling us about mycotoxins and fusarium. Um, fascinating stuff. I, I didn't realise it was a complex, actually, to be honest, right from the very beginning. So it shows you what I know about pathology, which is um, not great. So um, everybody else, thank you for joining us. And we have another presentation, another seminar in two weeks' time. It's a general seminar it's, uh, entitled Trends in Brewing Raw Material Usage. The central role of barley, and it's by David Cook again from Nottingham. Actually, we've got a we're set, set of trend here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, join us again in two weeks' time. And um, thank you again, Romiana. And if we could just show our appreciation one more time, um, I'd, I'd appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you very much as well for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Romiana. See you later. Bye, See everybody. You. Bye, everyone.